best I can come up with is I think resilience is using the perspective that losses and traumas give us to do or be something we couldn't have been or couldn't have done without those things happening to us. Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, where real people share real life experiences and the tools they've developed to move forward and live their best lives. I'm Jenny Taylor. And I'm Michelle Scharf. Today we are here for part two. She's just been an amazing friend, a longtime friend, Erin Preston. The reason that we, you and I, have both wanted her on the show for a long, long time is that in 2018, when we both lost our husbands, six weeks before John passed away, Aaron's husband died. And it was sudden, and it was shocking. I'm going to start crying. (laughs) And I remember thinking, as I knew that my husband's day was drawing near, I just thought, you know, I knew that this was coming, But for her to have this happen so suddenly, and it felt paralyzing to me. I didn't know how to reach out. I didn't know what should be said or done. And I was also just so terrified because I knew that my day was approaching quicker and quicker. So I knew you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And I knew that your husband was dying. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Brent had gone off to war. And... I was worried about both of you, but right after Brian died, there wasn't much left in me at all. You know, just getting out of bed was more than I could do uh, sometimes. And I have never in my life been somebody who had to ask for help. And suddenly I had to ask for help, which was shocking to me. But it actually taught me something about I've always been somebody who's taken care of things. I mean, for heaven's mm-hmm. sakes, I'm, a, I'm an education lawyer. I'm a big sister. I'm, the, you know, I'm mm-hmm. all these things. And I hadn't given a lot of people a lot of time in my life to let them ever take care of me. Brian right. was one of the only ones. So at the time when John died, I mm-hmm. didn't have anything to give you. Mm-hmm. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> I registered the loss, but it was, it was so soon after. Mm-hmm. 19 days was that what it was it yeah so 19 soon. or 20 days it was like july 17th Just a couple of weeks yeah. Yeah. yeah there were a few people who actually mistook us who when brian died they thought i was you and it was john dying it was a weird there it were was. several widows in our little political online group that had lost their spouses that year there's really four of us sue duckworth had lost yeah. Her husband, Carl, mm-hmm. before. And so there was four of us. It was like the year of the widow in that group. It was kind of rough. But I do remember calling you. I don't remember when. And now that I clearly have no reference of time, all I know is that I called to check on you. And when I did, I think that that's when you alerted me to some other losses that you had had. Yeah. And I just was like, okay, I've got nothing. Like, I don't need... I'm so uncomfortable making this phone call and I I am now like way over my head. I don't know how to support this. What what Michelle's referencing is that uh, my sister Jody and her husband Brad. The one that had come and, and, and the one who had been there the night that yeah. Brian died. Yeah. So I had in the month after Brian died, I had tried to go back to work. I mean, suddenly I had to make twice as much money. Suddenly, you know, the realities of life were kicking in. I had to take care of kids that weren't okay either. So I had begun. And July 30th was my first night where I was at a board meeting. And it was a doozy. I had to be there. It was down in Utah County. And uh, as I'm sitting there in a very intense meeting, I got a text on my phone that said Brad's had a heart attack he's on the way to the hospital oh my gosh and it didn't have everybody meet anything like that but I realized I'm close I'm close so I (laughs) screamed I think it's actually on a meeting recording somewhere and uh, drove as fast as I could to the hospital met 
my sister and her kids and the bishopric of her Springville ward was there. They were all wonderful. Brad had had a heart attack while he was mountain biking with his brother. He was 46. He was the second youngest of a, a large group of kids, and they were all still alive and healthy. His brother had resuscitated him on the bike ride, but they had lost him several times afterwards. But he was at the hospital. We were in the ER. They had got him back, and everything seemed to be stable. And so the the bishopric um, took my sister's kids home so that they could eat something, and then I stayed at the hospital with her. And not long after they left, the doctor came in and said he's crashed again. And uh, my sister and I have a funny relationship. It comes from being 18 months apart, like we're opposites in everything. We fight over everything since, you know, birth, and it still tease each other constantly. But in that moment, we just held each other as tight as we could. And uh, we knew what each other was feeling. And uh, the longer it took them to come back in, the more we knew, this isn't good, this isn't good, this isn't good. And uh, the doctor came back in and said, we keep reviving him, but as soon as we stop CPR, he we can't keep his blood pressure up. And uh, maybe another 15, 20 minutes, and he came in and he said, we are going to need to call it. I, there was a suggestion made that his, his brain would have suffered damage by this point, and they still couldn't keep his blood pressure up. And we just cried, and he said, I need a decision. And I said, okay, call it. And I said, Jody, is that okay? And she just whimpered and cried, but we were there. And they did, and she immediately asked, can we, can I see him? Can we see him? So we went in to the ER, and there he was. And she did the same thing I did. She just started touching his arms and his legs, and he had such strong legs. He, you know, just commenting mm-hmm. on things. And the doctors and nursing staff were surrounding us. And by this point in time, someone had told them that my husband had just died. And so the doctor said, you need to have every male in your family tested immediately. It was the descending aorta. They both had blocks in the descending aorta. But they're not family with each other. Right. And so they're talking to us and we're just kind of clueless and you need to have everybody in your family tested. And finally, I'm like, but we're the sisters. They're not related. And at that point, even the medical staff just eyes wide and they all walked the out. The phenomenon no one wants to touch. Right. right. It's exactly. like a terrible lottery to win. It is. Two sisters. Yeah. Okay. My my dad feels the same way about my sister. My, and my sister's also a widow. Her husband was gone like 15 years before my husband died and And my dad's like, you know, how did this happen to both of my daughters that they would lose their husbands, you know? But it is. And 30 days apart from each other, you know? Yeah. Like at at 44 and 46, both healthy. And very very healthy, not not chronically ill, not diagnosed with anything. Yeah. No. Not in a car accident that took their life, but no, it was a a hidden blockage that was missed on. I mean, Brian had just had a physical. Yeah. So, like, there was nothing that was picked up. No. And, uh, Immediately, the third sister from Oregon comes out again, and her husband comes out again, and we start making jokes about needing to wrap him in bubble wrap so nobody will think that we're trying to kill off all our husbands. Yeah. And, you know, that's the black humor we were going yeah. to at that point. Yeah. You know, dark humor, Jenny has it, I have it. Uh-huh. I think it comes with the territory for some widows. Definitely all three of us have it. You know, how, how do you move forward? Yeah, ex- exactly. Mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. It's really funny, by the way, side note, to see who picks up on the dark humor and who is just aghast at it. Right. And some people really are offended by it. I've even had people that didn't know John offended by my children who have uh-huh. also dark humor. I have to tell my daughter to be careful who's around when she says certain things. I'm like, I know what you mean. I know that's your broken heart speaking, but right. people around you might find that a little hard. Yeah, to I've hear. had my daughter say, yeah, my dad's dead. 
and then they're like, you know, stops that, that, that conversation in its that, tracks. That, that's over. Like now that person feels really terrible or whatever. You like it's hard, right? John's little brother, both of the brothers in that family have passed away. So he's oh. the only living sharf left. And we, you know, we do think he should be wrapped in bubble wrap and also <laughs> that he should live life to the fullest now yeah, because who knows? Right. And, and they all died from very different things. You know, John from cancer, which you never would have guessed that man was only sick five days in the 32 years that I was married to him. And John's brother from a motorcycle accident. So. Like, you just don't know how these lotteries are going to stack up in our life, right? Well, and is it a lottery? This is where you start going deep. You've got the gallows humor, certainly, mm-hmm. but this is when things start to become much deeper. Mm-hmm. And so to finish, because there's more, Brian shared a firehouse with a wonderful fire captain named uh, Matt Burchett, Maddie, and... As I said, Brian had a fireman's funeral. They, Canyon School District gave us uh, Corner Canyon's amphitheater, which was filled like a thousand people. Um, So many fire departments brought their fire gear, so many firemen in suits, so many people telling me stories about Brian. And Matt was one who was who was just right there, who was helping me through things. And he was very quiet, and he had this quirky, awesome sense of humor, but just so kind and understanding. And anyway, got news on August 13th. He was with the Wildlands Fire Crew fighting fires in California. And due to an error on the part of a pilot who was supposed to be doing a drop, he had called in the drop. The pilot hadn't accounted for the slope, and the way they dropped the water, it hit a burning tree that landed directly on him, and and he was killed. He was younger. I think he was in his mid-30s. And I had some wonderful conversations with his wife about why, why him. There was a line of them, Mm -hmm. and he was their leader. He wouldn't have wanted it to happen to the person on the right, on the left, anyone on the line. But if anyone was going to go, he would have wanted it to be him, but she didn't want it to be him. Mm -hmm. Just an amazing, phenomenal woman. But another flag-draped coffin, and luckily another moment of being in the fire family, fire department family, because I went to the funeral alone. I had to. I had to. Mm -hmm. And I had to go, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't imagine bringing anyone else. And uh, the Tooele Fire Department, uh, Brian loved. He was an honorary member. They saw me, and they came and got me, and they had me sit with them, and we we all cried together all the way through it. And just... I remember when that happened to you. That was horrific it was like oh my gosh what is going on with this year why is god taking up all of these amazing men in our community yeah Yeah. and they were they were they were just i feel that way about john i feel that way about brent i feel that way about brian i feel that way about this other man it's like it was a hard year it it, 2018 was rough yeah and so got through that um i became really good at the paperwork of death that's what i called it being an attorney probably helps you with that. Yeah, I mean, there's that part of it, but there's also when we went to the mortuary for Brad. I mean, I bought plots and we were in and out of the mortuary in 30 minutes as opposed to how much longer it took for Brian. And I got really good at getting really fast at things. Mm-hmm. If I ever write a book, that chapter is going to be two funerals on one Amex bill. But oh, that's it, terrible, Aaron. It's funny. Oh, please joke. <laughs> oh. oh, because it did. It showed up that way too. Oh, that's and same. It, same yeah. Cycle. Yeah. I kept it. It's funny. Um. Anyway, because oh. what else is there to do? Not to mention that's a hefty bill. Like we're not even talking <laughs> the finances of death. I mean, right. you kind of allude to the fact that now you need to make double to provide for your family, but funerals yeah. and burial and life in grief are expensive. They right? are. They are, and you don't see these things coming, and then grief is the, the most expensive. Yeah. I thought the funeral was expensive. 
grief itself, the time it costs you from work, yeah. yes, the time it costs you with therapy, the to time get it costs you back together with yeah. for me, for it, me, it, it was my kids, right? The extended my kids too. I offered my kids, they didn't take me up on it, but yeah. And for me, I I remained in therapy until last year. <laughs> hey, I'm still as needed, but my kids were starting to fall apart at this point. All of them in different it's just ways. So much, yeah, yeah. But my youngest was he was thirteen. Like thirteen doesn't suck bad enough. No, I was going to say that's a terrible age for anything. It's right. the worst. It's the worst. Age. I hate it. Thirteen. If anyone says what was the worst year of your your life, thirteen for yeah. sure. Thir- it, just thirteen. Yeah. But Brian had <laughs> blanket <been> statement. <laughs> such an amazing stepdad to him, and seven years he had coached him in baseball. They had been close in all sorts of different ways, and. He'd been close uh, with my other son. We had all been close to each other. And at first, I just needed to learn how to breathe. But almost as soon as I did, I realized my kids weren't okay. And the youngest among them was at the worst. And I started to see little things that were growing into bigger things. I was watching all of the kids as best I could, but, you know, with... It's like you don't have glasses on. You can't see everything clearly. Everything's foggy. Everything's foggy. Things are going in and out. There's, you're not even sure what's real sometimes. I mean, there's a real depth in spirituality. Of, I don't know how to put it except in a Mormon term that the veil just gets so very thin. And my sister and I are having conversations about why did God take them at once? You know, and we each had kids that needed help. And anyway, and then Brent, and then Brent, who I had been worried about about since he went on deployment. And I saw that come across and I, I honestly thought, oh, I'm so sorry. But I honestly thought, I don't think I can go. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can see another flag draped coffin. And Michelle Michelle said, we're going to go. We're going to go together. I'll drive. I've got this fun sports car. We'll make it happen. It'll be okay. And she got me there at a time when I probably wasn't safe We to tried drive. to go see the flag, but evidently I didn't know where it was. Wrong canyon. <laughs> Wrong canyon entirely. We went off-roading with our cute little sports mobile. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, well, well, that's when I had the Porsche, but... But then at the funeral. But then at the funeral, you're the one that took that photo of Jenny and I, which was our first connection to one another, our first embrace, our first It's meeting. the first time we ever really met mm-hmm. any of you, both of you. Yeah. I met you in line at the viewing of Brent's funeral. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yep. I remember that moment, although I, I don't remember the picture. Maybe I gave it to you and you haven't given it back, being all selfish like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's used on our podcast promos. Oh, I look forward to seeing it. Um, that's yours, Aaron Preston, photographer. Oh, photo did credit. you get me credit? Photo credit, excellent. Um, <laughs> I don't think we did, but we will. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The, the, it was one of the things that I had learned, and I want to get into the the positives here and the things I've learned, whether they're positive or not. Sure, but lessons learned have a value. They, they do, and one of them is take pictures. Take the pictures. It doesn't matter if it's maybe not the appropriate time. Or if you don't look your best, or if your hair's not done, or if your makeup's not done, or if you're not feeling so great, or if you don't have the best smile, or whatever. Take the photo. Vanity doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't matter at this stage at all. And, I mean, how many pictures do, do we all have of, you know, mascara coming off our chin and such? But take the pictures, because those are the, the memories of a very foggy time that will give you little insights, little memories that will stay. My mother did not like taking photos, so she's Uh not in almost any of our photos of our childhood. Uh And we almost have no photos. She just didn't take them. And um, she has Alzheimer's now. Uh And I've been uh, Uh back to the house, and I've been through the boxes of photos, but there's just not very many photos of her with us. And take the photos. Well, it goes with the bigger picture of Mm -hmm. you don't know how long you've got. Right. You don't know how long anybody has. And as my kids, but one especially, started going downhill quickly, I 
started taking more and more pictures just almost to document. But I did take pictures of Brian's body. I took just to remind me that, no, he he looks dead. He mm-hmm. was dead. He was dead. Mm-hmm. I didn't make that up, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the pictures of the grieving together. And although one of my favorite pictures is actually at my sister my sister's husband's funeral. Um, it was the three sisters and then a cousin who was raised with us, who's our age. And we're all standing there in front of the casket. And uh, my sister, Jody. it was just a sad picture, but we wanted some sort of memory of it. But she goosed us. And we're, we're all laughing because, you know, she just pinched our butts and we're all giggling and like, tears plus giggles plus this look on her face like I got him I got him because that's what every she's emotion been I want to see that photo I bet it's a great photo. I will I will happily show you that photo it was every emotion So to get back just a little bit to Brian's funeral, I want to talk about how the kids took steps forward and how we all began to take steps forward. So I mentioned that Brian's son was insistent on giving one of the obituaries. And we were all up on the stage together, all the kids, me and his sister, and uh, then our foster daughter was on the front row. And uh, he went through and he said, these are a lot of things that my Brian, that my father Brian was, and each of us now represents him differently in our lives. And he went down the row and one of his sisters loves the outdoors and she loves everything about the out- outdoors. She loves snowboarding like he did. She, He went through each of them. Uh, one of my sons loves music. They would play pool and listen to records until late at night and talk music to no end. And then uh, my youngest, he was his baseball coach for forever, and so he was athleticism. And each of the kids was something else. And then he spoke about himself, and he said, I hope to have these traits, these personal empathy, kindness traits of my father. And I can't think of a better eulogy because he had really nailed the impact that Brian had left on each of us. And from there, we kept trying to focus on the positives. We kept trying to make things funny. Thanksgiving that year, we did a widows and orphans only Thanksgiving with the kids and and my sister and her kids. You don't have a death certificate, no pie for you. Um, Just... (laughs) A lot of ridiculous, stupid things, but we were all laughing because we so desperately needed to laugh. And we had all been through so much, and it was almost this signal of... Well, it almost gets to a point, don't you feel like, that it's like stupid reality. Like, is this really... Yeah. This is really it. This really happened. Because there's a part of your brain that just struggles with believing it. Yeah. And somehow humor... I know for me, and John brought the humor into my life. And so I know for me, humor did kind of help heal the sucky stuff to make fun of, this is ridiculous. He's not here. Well, and, you know, and it was so part of our life. And, and you have to laugh. You have to have moments where you just breathe again and laughing makes you breathe a little bit. And to your both of you made a point about you know don't say my dad's dead don't you know it's hard for people to hear I became a I'm not sure I was ever a normal mother but I became a very (laughs) different mother in that we had all just gone through this enormous trauma together we were still going through these traumas together I didn't edit my kids at all Mm -hmm. and we all got very used to getting odd looks yeah I didn't actually edit my children at all, but, but I observed it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, some people really can't handle this. 
It was interesting to see because it almost became a test of can you handle it or not. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not going to shield you from my reality for your sake. Now, you know, we didn't right. try and level, level anybody with it, but right. where's your where's your dad? Well, he's dead. Why this? Why that? Well, this, that, and the other. There were a couple notes I have here. We changed. Some things changed about us all immediately. We said, I love you. Nobody talked to anybody without saying, I love you, and I love you back. Whenever we were together, hugs were freely given. And we had, in my family, some Western stoicism. I think that was true for Brian and his family as well. But suddenly it became every kid, every family member, every dear friend, I love you. And kind of like what Brian would say about if they don't want the hug is when they need it the most. If they didn't want to hear I love you, suck it up. I love you. You need to hear it Mm -hmm. because I need to tell you that because tomorrow is an unknown. Mm -hmm. And so that became one of our things and it's still going. And we have all become so much closer with dropping any artifices or any you should act this way in the world. And almost as low as we went, which got very low, the more we got to the reality of why are we here? What are we doing? What is this all for? One of my sons was playing his guitar downstairs. He was, music was something he and Brian did and he was just playing his guitar in his room and I went down and He was working on a new piece, and I just stuck my head in, and sometimes you don't have to say words, you know. And he said, Mom, I had a thought. Brian and Brad got to die because they were done with whatever they had to do here in life. We don't get to die until we've done what we have to do or we've become who we need to become. Then we get to die. And son, our are you becoming religious on me? And he said, no, I, I hope that it's a dirt nap. I hope that there's nothing after. I hope that we can be free of this pain. But I just think this is the way it is. Things are connected. Things go the way they are. We don't get to die until we've done what we have to do or become what we need to be. And those are the kind of insights that we started to have. And that was the stuff that I didn't want to shield other people from. I started saying some of these things. They started saying some of these things. What people's reactions were, that was up to them. There was one moment with my youngest who was suffering the most, the one who was 13. He was six foot three at the time Brian died. Brian died like, one millimeter short of him passing him up and uh, quickly went to 6'4 and then his stomach, he was throwing up all the time. He couldn't eat. He, the mental health stuff was, was just beyond what I could even grasp. The struggling was horrific for all of us, but for him, I, I really thought we're going to lose him. And So enough time for me to grieve. What has to happen now is I have to save him. I have to do everything I can. And others stepped in, and I'll never forget the teachers and such who would find him passed out in the hallway because he wasn't eating and he wasn't drinking, and he was six foot four and 116 pounds. And we started setting goals like if you can... Drink an entire Ensure Plus, which are high calorie, and keep it down for 20 minutes. So that'll give you enough nutrition for your brain for the day. And so it became a race to try and keep food down. But th- this was our daily existence. Some at the school were understanding, some were not. Some, I think, saved his life because they would tell me things that I couldn't yet absorb. I, I knew I was seeing something wrong but I couldn't quite understand what it was, and he began confiding in those who didn't shy away from him when he said the hard stuff. There was one moment, though, that I... A bunch of boys had 
uh, I guess, been smoking in the bathroom at the local junior high and um, not wanting to get caught. Uh, one of them had said it was my son who was in there smoking and I don't care if my son smokes at this point or not. I just wanted him alive, but I, I knew he wasn't smoking. I didn't think that was him because through all of this and really through his whole life, he's always told me the truth. Whether I want to hear it or not, I'm getting the mm-hmm. truth. Right. <laughs> and he said, Mom, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. And they tried to get him to say who it was. And he's like, no, but I didn't do it. And there was a counselor who brought him in after one of the other boys admitted that he had lied and that my son hadn't been smoking in the bathroom. And this counselor still insisted on giving a lecture to him about how, um, you know, he needed to get good grades and move on to high school and do well there. And then he could go on to college and be successful. And then someday he could have a job like his, you know, being a counselor at a junior high. And the look on my son's face was somewhere between sad anger, frustration, bewilderment, and, um, and disappointment because he didn't want to be a yeah. school counselor. <laughs> I wish I wish we too, were to that point, but um, I said to another counselor who was there who was wonderful, I said, can you please take my son out in the hallway for a minute? And I stayed there with uh, an assistant principal who was one of our angels and said, sir, his stepdad just died healthy at 44, just short of retirement. Um, his uncle just died. There is no high school. There is no job in the future. There is no going to college. There is no high school. He doesn't think tomorrow. He can't think past tomorrow. Don't give him this lecture about how sequential life is and how if we just all check all the boxes, everything's going to be fine because he knows you're lying to him, whether you mean to be or not. And that was one of those moments of somebody being taken about aback and not being able to hear it. And I had an epiphany myself in that of my son is wiser than you. Mm -hmm. And he, you are not helping him with this story and you are not helping him with this advice. He is wiser than you. We had some other things that ultimately led to me taking him to the hospital not sure if he was going to make it or not and it was a long night of crying and just a horrible sadness and not knowing if he wanted to live and I wasn't sure if I wanted to live it was really hard to live and and then my other son was in and out and after six hours interviews with doctors and such they came out and said we're sending him home with you and I said are you sure And they said, yeah, he can't, he knows that if something happens to him, you won't make it. And I went in, I was flabbergasted because you don't think of your kids seeing you that way. And what he said is we're a triangle, the three of us now. And if any corner falls, the other two fall. I don't get to die. I can't die because it'll kill the other two of you. You won't be able to survive it. So we all have to stay alive together, and only one of us gets to break down at a time. And so for the next year or so, every once in a while, even still, okay, only one of us gets to break down this time. Who's it going to be? Who needs it the worst? And we're there for each other, and the second tier is there, you know, the, the other siblings, my sister and her kids, and we're there to support, but... There's nothing shallow. The conversations are deep and meaningful, unless they're overtly intended not to be. You know, where's the death Mm -hmm. certificate or you don't get pie? But there are deep conversations about deep things. Nothing is off the table. And we know what we know, and we've each in our own ways and in our own moments felt the other side and those in it and probably won't get into sharing that too much except that I had a moment where where I saw everything and nothing at all but I 
felt what it was. I saw Brian. I I felt him. I felt what he was saying to me. And just like that, it was gone. But that's all I need to know. That's all I need to know for the rest of my life is that there's something there. And I might have gotten the 2 plus 2 equals 4 version of it, knowing that it's really quantum physics. But all my brain can handle right now is but the 2 plus 2 equals yeah. 4 version of it. And that's enough. And each of us in our own way have had those moments of life is a struggle and there's grief and there's things that are so hard, but I love you and moments are not taken for granted. And there's a depth to all of our lives that just wasn't there before. And we didn't want it. We didn't want what led to it, but... It is what it is now, and we are stronger for it. It is what it is now, and we are stronger for it. One thing with my youngest is he has recovered. They've all recovered in different ways, but they've all become different people. But my youngest, who had the hardest time, in some ways recovered the farthest because he had to go to such a dark place. And now he's only 18. But sometimes I talk to him, I feel like I'm talking to a 40 or a 50-year-old, and it occurs to me, with him and the others, how much they've already lived more than most of us will ever live our lives. They've gone to darker places. They've found their way out of it. They've found the things in their life that still need to happen, that still need to be. And they're moving forward with them. You know, one thing that makes me sad is when I see people stop after these losses and we all do. We all have moments of, okay, I'm going to just cry today. Or sometimes I even want to sugarcoat anything that's happened, but I don't. I, I like talking about Brian. I give presentations sometimes in schools, and I'll talk about my husband, who was a fireman who inspected schools, would point to this, this, and this. And I won't mention that he's dead. Or if anybody asks... He passed away. I'll say it. I don't want to guard anybody from, from the. I don't want to sanitize the truth. I don't want to be sharing something that is less than what we had because I feel like, as awful as it is, what we had, my family, my surrounding family, my sister, it was a gift of the worst kind that has led us to be different people now. So. I might end on a story that from my youngest. So, like I said, he went to a very dark place, and he's now doing extraordinarily well. He's six eight and tall and handsome and smart, and he's graduated um, high school, <coughs> even though he spent significant amounts of time outside of high school, because that was what survival meant. And. For the longest time, as he was getting better and better and better, he he shunned all the doctors, he shunned medication, everybody else. He's like, this is what I've been through. This is my life. This is my brain. I have to figure out a way how to live my life myself. It can't be about anybody telling me what to do. And uh, as he's gone on that journey and come out farther and farther, he would say, I wish Brian could see me. I wish... Brian could see how far I've come. And about a month ago, he had another benchmark achievement that was awesome. And he started to say, I wish Brian could see. And then he said, no, I wouldn't be who I am now if Brian hadn't died. I'm not going to say I wish he could see me now because I wouldn't be me if he were here. And he was proud of himself. And I think all of us, to some extent, are of, okay, whatever it is that we have to learn, whatever it is we have to do, 
we've been given the good shaking of, okay, this is reality now. You go out and do things. Don't waste time. Don't waste friendships. Don't waste people. Say I love you. It's really beautiful. You know, a lot of people in the world today feel like they're not seen. And it sounds to me like your kids know the value of seeing people. Yes. And that's really a gift because people will be drawn to them. They are. Yeah. They are. And it's really interesting to watch how drawn to them people are without knowing why. Mm -hmm. And perhaps my youngest the most because he was in high school, you know, land of shallowness. And yet people, teachers, others would just be drawn to them and not know why. And then random conversations would occur and they would realize the depth of what he had been through and what he had dealt with. And each of them, each Mm -hmm. of them in their own way. My stepdaughter works with special needs kids and she makes life fun. Like Brian made life fun, but it's not, it's not without the sad side of fun Mm -hmm. too. You know, each of them in their own way are being overt about who they are and what they've seen and talking to people about it. They don't shy away from the conversations and they hug people too. Yeah. It's really beautiful and it, it, it is a gift in the worst kind of ways but it is a gift and um you know you can choose to go through a situation like this and not heal from the trauma and then instead you continue to hurt other people in your life or have expectations for people to show up for you in a specific way but when you do your own work and you heal these things and you learn these lessons that you've shared with us today they truly provide a sense of depth and warmth that we need in this world. Yeah. And healing that that's not only for yourself, but for those around you, which also we need in this world today. Brian and I used to say to each other, we had gone through some hard things in life. And one day after just something really hard with work had happened, it's like, okay, we're going to make it. And I said, we've been through worse. And we kind of laughed, but it kind of became our mantra. Okay, yeah. we've been through worse. And then after he died, that's almost the family's mantra. We've been through worse. And, you know, sometimes it comes with, anybody dead today? Nope. Mm-hmm. Good. We've been through worse. Right. But it's real. It we've is real. been through worse. And every time you go through something worse, you have the opportunity to try and make something good of the pain that can sometimes be quite beautiful. So tell us, what does resilience mean to you? (laughs) The best I can come up with is I think resilience is using the perspective that losses and traumas give us to do or be something we couldn't have been or couldn't have done without those things happening to us. Resilience is, or can be, in the best sense, the springboard onto things that you never would have gone on to. If Absolutely. Not. Yeah. Making purpose, creating a purpose out of loss. Absolutely. Not being afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, perspective. Perspective has changed for all of us. What a bad day is. Well, like you said, if your scale of one to 10, the one is a dead guy on the floor in the kitchen. Like, okay, most things fall further right. than one at least. Bad hair day isn't even yeah. in bottom five, right? Yeah. So right. <laughs> Stuff that, that maybe otherwise would have caused major stress takes its place in the in the bigger perspective. Yeah. Been through worse. I've been through worse. I love how your son said he's become who he is because of the loss he's faced. And for him to recognize that at such a young age. Mm-hmm is powerful and what a what a compassionate person he'll be able to be to people for decades that he meets in different stages and ages of his own life recognize that i i wish brian could see what i'm doing but it's actually because he can't see me that i'm 
doing able it. to do what I'm doing. Yeah. That, that's, that's beautiful. Powerful. Yeah, that that's is. Powerful. If he were here to support me, I wouldn't have learned it on my own, right. which is what needed to happen. Yeah. Not what we wanted it to happen, but what happened. And to make something beautiful out of what happens. Well, same as with you. I love that. Yeah, we talk all the time. We're different people. It's only for all three of us. It's five mm-hmm. years. In the last five years, all three of us have buried a husband, and for the last five years, all of us have gone up and down and forward more than mm-hmm. anything. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we're like you said, it's yesterday or a thousand years ago or all at <laughs> once. I'm not sure. E- even over this past weekend, we were talking and said something about Brent. I can't remember what exactly we said, but it kind of hit me brand new again. Like, oh yeah, Brent's dead. Of course, I yeah. know Brent's dead, but there are those moments where you just, what does death mean? What does that really mean? And it, it's almost, it's fuzzy. Like you, anyway, this has been a good conversation to reflect on the, I love your definition of resilience, that the hard things we go through, resilience is where we go from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And recognizing that the hard things we go through actually contribute to our resilience. Like it or not, it makes us more resilient as we have to be resilient not yeah. have to be choose, choose to, to be, be. Right. fair choose to be as we grow and develop those muscles right well because caring. we refuse to sink right yeah. it's, it's sink or swim well i guess we're going to figure out how to swim yeah my other son would say we're still alive we've still got things we have to do <laughs> get to work yes yeah, exactly making excuses yeah. <sighs> This well, exhausting. thank you so much for being on today. We really appreciate sharing you sharing your story with us. And um, yeah, love you, it, sisters. It, it's a lot. <laughs> We've bonded. A lot. A, we we could talk day. about so many different things. Just in like a roundtable, it'd be fun to almost have Sue Duckworth come in and the four oh of us goodness. talk about because like grief is just so interesting. It impacts everybody differently. I personally don't have any judgment on how anyone does it because we don't know the full picture of that person's perspective, their life history. And, and the, we and might do it differently from time to time in our own experience. Oh, like where I am in my journey might look more like your journey later or before or mm-hmm. after. It's dynamic across and between each Yeah, of us. absolutely. Don't judge anybody until you've walked in their shoes. And are you sure those are the shoes you want to put on? you're going to give those shoes right back, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. My mom used to always say that when we were kids. Like if you were to pass around a list and say, write down all the horrible, awful things you faced in life, you'd probably be very happy with your own list. Uh-huh. Because right. like you said, God, the universe or whoever it is knows what we can and can't handle what we can and can't go grow through or might choose to grow through but i think that's what this show is all about right yeah that being relentless in our resilience and recognizing it doesn't come easy and it doesn't come alone but it can come yeah absolutely i love what you guys do with us oh thank Thanks you so this. much if you like what you've heard today and you have a story you'd like to share be sure to look us up either on instagram at relentlessly resilient podcast or on facebook at relentlessly resilient you can click a little box. I'm available to book a 15 minute interview and I'd love to talk with you and, and hear about how your story of resilience has shaped and changed your life. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to wherever you listen to us on the podcast and give us a like and a rating and a review. It helps us move up in those rankings in the podcast world. And remember, whatever you do today, remember to be kind. You have no idea the struggles other people are dealing with in their lives. Have a good day, everybody.